Hello everyone. Um, I wanted in this uh, post lecture video, um, I wanted to show you um, <coughs> a bit few details about um, uh, the uh, one of the <coughs> non ideal uh, phenomena that uh, we discussed today uh, when we were discussing uh, non ideal effects on the IV characteristic of, of the p injunction. Um, uh, so I wanted to discuss uh, uh, the um, uh, junction breakdown uh, effect. Um, this is something that uh, anyway uh, um, uh, we were going to do you know, very qualitatively, but uh, you know I wanted to give you some more details, uh, and uh, it is a quite interesting you know uh, um, uh, phenomenon. Anyway, and um, <clears throat> and the second thing that I wanted to do is. Uh, so today we discussed uh, the um, um, toward the end the, the um, linear piecewise linear uh, approximation of the p injunctions uh, IV characteristic, and uh, I wanted to uh, show you some circuit applications now of the p injunction and uh, some very cool ones. Uh, that uh, should, uh, you know, uh, uh, highlight the power of this extremely simple, in a way, device, but uh, you can do so many interesting th th things with it. So I, I, I will limit myself to really just uh, uh, two very similar applications, uh, but uh, uh, very, very interesting. Um, uh, so uh, please uh, have a look and I'll see you next time. <clears throat> okay, uh, so um, uh, today uh, among the um, nonlinear, uh, uh, sorry, the non-ideal effects we discussed, um, excuse me, Um, the one we uh, simply just mentioned very briefly, but we didn't really say anything even qualitatively about it, was the uh, junction, break, junction breakdown that takes place in reverse bias. So um, uh, just, just to briefly remind you, the, the non-ideal effects that may uh, be relevant uh, uh, when we uh, consider the IV characteristic of our p injunction as compared to the to the to the shock equation that we derived uh, the other the other time uh, are those here so there are mainly five so we discussed today the the generation current uh, for reverse bias we forward bias we discussed the regeneration recombination current high level injection effects and the, the series resistance effect. And so what is left to do is to have a brief look at junction breakdown. So uh, if you, um, we, we briefly said today what it is. And uh, so if you remember uh, in reverse bias, what we said uh, when the voltage is extremely negative, also large but negative, uh, what uh, may happen is that the PN junction uh, breaks down. The, G, the p injunctions uh, may uh, may break down, uh, which means that effectively the absolute value of the current becomes extremely larger than the um, than the value of J zero. It uh, would have, uh, uh, according to to shock to the Shockley equation. And so, uh, uh, what happens is effectively what is depicted here in this uh, in this part. So the the current suddenly the IV has this uh, vertical, effectively, if you like, behavior here. And uh, we anticipated today that uh, there may be uh, uh, mainly three mechanisms that may cause this, or may contribute, anyway, that may play a role. The first one is uh, avalanche multiplication of minority carriers. The second is uh, tunneling from band to band. And the third one is uh, thermal instabilities. The first one is uh, uh, that we sh we should briefly consider is uh, thermal stability. 
Now, uh, this uh, uh, relates to the fact that as we've seen uh, when we last week when we uh, derived the Shockley equation, J0 is actually a function of temperature. And it depends on temperature according to this uh, this uh, this uh, uh, this formula here. So it's proportional uh, to the e to the minus e g over k t. So if t goes up, uh, j zero goes up exponentially. Okay, so very strong dependence. Also, uh, the, uh, j zero depends on the energy gap of the semiconductor. So if the energy gap goes down, also j zero goes up. So this immediately means that thermal instabilities may be very important for germanium because germanium has a small uh, EG which means that J0 will be larger than J0 in any other semiconductor at for same temperature. So anyway, uh, the, the, the idea behind uh, originating, let's say, the, the, the phenomenon originating thermal instabilities is exactly this. It's, it's all in here. So, uh, in reverse bias, we've seen that uh, 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 when uh, V is very much smaller than, uh, than zero, uh, uh, the, the movement of charge carriers is all about the drifting of minority carriers effectively under a larger electric field now because v is very much negative here and uh, in during uh, the their drift what these carriers do is they impact uh, they they collide with uh, impurities with uh, lattice uh, atoms and so on and so forth and they release in this way a lot of energy through these collisions and so this cause a temperature increase and so this temperature increase causes an increase in j0 which then increases further the temperature and so on this is clearly what we call a positive feedback effect and we it is uh, in electronics as a specific uh, term actually it would, this is called the thermal runaway so uh, the system heats up the current increases, this current increase further heats up the system, and so on and so forth. And so there is a, uh, this, uh, this explosion, let's say. Uh, uh, and, and so the, 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 in terms of IV characteristics, what we notice when, uh, you know, in presence of uh, thermal uh, instabilities is that there is a characteristic voltage, which we indicate with VU, uh, which is called the turnover voltage at which uh, the system uh, which is effectively the maximum negative voltage that the, the uh, can be observed in the in the pn junction during this phenomenon and so effectively uh, we can see that the the, the um, uh, iv characteristic has this shape and um, Now, let us have a look at the other two uh, mechanisms. So the, the, the one that is uh, particularly interesting is avalanche multiplication. So under a high reverse bias, um, the energy diagram of the PN junction looks actually like this if you remember uh, and uh, the, mainly the movement of carriers as we said is mainly due to the drift of minority carriers from one side to the other but uh, um, now if the electric field that we are applying is extremely large because the voltage is very negative then what what may happen is that these minority carriers may acquire enough energy between consecutive collision, collision, collisions remember uh, to cause to generate actually more carriers via impact ionization so the the energy they have is enough to actually free electrons from the crystal and so 
free them from the crystal and so make them available for conduction as well. So this means that the, the energy required for this to happen is of few AV, obviously. Um, so uh, when this elect the electric field is large enough, uh, impact ionization, ionization may become possible. And uh, al al along the whole journey that these uh, minority carriers that are drifting uh, uh, along the uh, within the, uh, the the depletion region, uh, um, along the whole their whole journey, uh, what they will cause is a is a, a, an avalanche effectively of carriers, and so that's why the whole phenomenon is called avalanche multiplication. And so the reverse current, because of all avalanche multiplication, can become huge extremely large and so here we have a representation of what i just described so the the carriers that are drifting they are accelerated by the presence of the uh, electric field which is a mixture it's a, the, the, the external electric field added to the internal electric field and so very intense electric field overall and so uh, this the initial carrier can generate for example two extra carriers these two are there on the on their hand on the other hand can be also accelerated and so generate more and more and more and more and so in the end when the carriers enter finally the end side in this case we have a huge number of charge carriers generated by a single one at the beginning of the process and so that's why this is called avalanche multiplication and uh, in this case, uh, the system uh, effectively has, uh, when, when in this regime, when avalanche multiplication is taking place, the voltage uh, across the PN junction is effectively constant, and this is called simply breakdown voltage, VBD. And the current is effectively, you know, a vertical line. So the IV characteristic becomes nearly a vertical line. Uh, this breakdown voltage, we can demonstrate that uh, for, for the P plus N uh, abrupt junction, that they could be written down in this way. So obviously the minus is to indicate that it is negative. That, uh, uh, sorry, here there is a typo. This should be probably minus VB, minus VBD. And... Uh, <coughs> And so, um, what, what do we see here in this formula? Epsilon S is the dielectric constant of the semiconductor. E max is the uh, maximum electric field we will see in a moment uh, required for impact ionization to take place. And uh, 2 E is the um, elementary charge. And N is, the, uh, is either ND, for our P plus N case, or anyway, the smaller between the dopant density and the acceptor density. Now, Emax, eh, we can demonstrate experimentally that uh, the, the, the electric field required for impact ionization to take place has this experimental uh, shape. So, as you can see, some numbers, but eventually depends on the uh, N, which is the density of the impurities on the N side in our P plus N, or anyway, the, uh, the density of impurities in the less doped side of the two. And uh, uh, um, what we can uh, um, uh, finally, let's say, see, is that uh, the breakdown voltage, if you, uh, as we've seen uh, above by, by these formulas, is that in the end, the breakdown voltage depends on N, on the impurity density, for the N side in our case, the dopant density, uh, the donor density, sorry. And so, uh, ex experimentally, we can uh, demonstrate that VBD uh, has this uh, uh, this dependence for silicon, for gallium arsenide, or other semiconductor, has uh, this kind of uh, dependence from the the impurity concentration. 
what is interesting to see is here is that by changing n i can tune the breakdown voltage to the value i may be interested in from few volts look this is simply three volts remember this is minus three volts is in the reverse region uh, from three volts on this plot up to hundreds so here for the first time we see that it is possible by design uh, uh, create a pn junction with a specific breakdown voltage and uh, <clears throat> actually if we we work a little bit uh, uh, more on these formulas above and uh, we do some uh, approximations uh, we can actually end up with a nice little tight formula for VBD uh, which is this one here and so the breakdown voltage is roughly given for any semiconductor now as you can see depending on EG roughly by this formula okay this is particularly interesting and uh, because we can see that we can tune the breakdown voltage simply by using uh, uh, by by design by using a specific semiconductor and that specific uh, um, uh, donor density if we are talking about p plus n uh, junction uh, the other phenomenon and the last one that uh, uh, is behind uh, could be behind uh, the junction breakdown is actually tunneling so quantum mechanical tunneling now just to remind you probably you've done these things in quantum mechanics already what uh, quantum mechanical things what quantum mechanical tunneling is so uh, let us imagine that uh, i have a, a free electron that according to particle wave duality could be represented as a, a wave as i try to do here moving from the left to right and uh, let us imagine that the energy profile is represented by this uh, profile here so there is a barrier this barrier in front of this particle that is moving with an energy e that is between e0 and e1 so the particle is going to hit the barrier that's the point now classically the particle will never be allowed to move to the other side but quantum mechanics uh, uh, in quantum mechanics that is possible and uh, and so there is a probability bigger than zero that the particle is found at a distance d uh, so up at the end effectively at the end of the barrier and this probability to find the particle emerging at a distance d distance d is actually proportional we can demonstrate to e it's an exponential function e to the minus 2kd where d is the thickness of the barrier and k is uh, uh, the wave vector of the particle but it's a special one because it's related to uh, the, w the 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 k of the particle when it was within the barrier so is is this one here anyway as you can see it depends on e1 minus e so it's the distance between the top of the barrier and the energy of the particle when it uh, before it uh, entered the, the the barrier let's say penetrated the barrier so it depends exponentially what is important here is that this probability depends exponentially on the uh, uh, tunneling distance if you like d but nevertheless this number is non-zero and that is important so this means that in reverse bias valence band carriers could actually tunnel quantum mechanically to the other side of the junction into the uh, conduction band we we explain this here with this diagram so when the when we we, we are in reverse bias and the reverse bias is large uh, this part is is pulled up quite a lot okay so the 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 
in the valence band, for example, here, in our valence band, there will be plenty of holes, but there will also be a plenty of electrons that are bound, that didn't make it to the conduction band. Now, this electron here has a non-zero probability to tunnel into the conduction band on the other side, traveling this distance. Same for the holes in the conduction band here. There are plenty of electrons, sure, because this side is doped N, but there are also a huge number of holes here. And so this hole has a non-zero probability to tunnel this side. And so as we see, these tunneling currents both effectively go in this direction. The tunneling current overall goes in this direction. And so we see that this will, it, 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 it is negative, obviously. It goes opposite to the positive direction we had set for the forward bias uh, pin junction. So it is typical for the reverse uh, situation. And it's huge. It must be huge because there are a huge number here in this uh, in the valence band of the p side there is a huge number of electrons much much bigger than the majority holes same story here there is a huge number of holes much much bigger than the uh, majority electrons and the reason is explained here so consider the case of silicon okay so say that we have uh, 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 p plus n junction so the p plus side has a uh, uh, p p zero which is the density of the majority carriers the holes is 10 to the 18 in the valence band okay in the conduction band n p zero is the density of the electrons is n i squared over p p zero and this is using the mass action law 10 to the 20 remember that n i for silicon is 10 to the 10 so 10 to the 20 over 10 to the 18 this is 10 to the 2. So in the conduction band, we have just 10 to the 2. Now, on the other hand, uh, the silicon lattice, if we remember our uh, solid state uh, 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 lectures, uh, in, the, in, the, in the silicon lattice, in, in the silicon uh, crystal, the lattice constant, which is the distance between two neighboring atoms, is uh, roughly of this order few tenths of nanometers so 0 2 nanometers let's say so 2 10 to the minus 8 centimeters so this means that roughly very roughly the density of silicon atoms in a piece of crystal of silicon crystal is 1 over a to the cube which is roughly this number 10 to the 23 per to the 23 per cubic centimeter now this is the number of silicon atoms each silicon atom has 14 electrons so the total density of electrons is for roughly 10 to the 24 per cubic centimeter so just in the valence band because remember a certain number of electrons have been promoted into the conduction band 10 to the 2 2 per cubic centimeter so the total number of electrons, the density of electrons, in the valence band is actually the number of electrons, the total number of electrons, minus n. And this is obviously, because n is effectively negligible, this actually is 10 to the 24 per cubic centimeter. So we understand that these electrons is a huge number. So even if this probability is very small, the actual uh, number of electrons that will attempt to go, will be found in the other side is huge because the, the, the density of these electrons is huge, 10 to the 24 per cubic centimeter. Okay. So this is an important point and this effectively can make the, the, the tunneling current uh, which is which could be behind the junction breakdown effectively huge okay so concluding this part uh, if 
we can demonstrate that if the breakdown voltage is smaller than 4 eg over e this means roughly for the case of silicon this means roughly uh, 4.5 ev 4.5 uh, 4 volts so uh, remember that um, we are we are uh, all, all everything we say in, uh, we are saying now uh, in, at this point uh, relates to the reverse bias eh? but obviously we are using the numbers without the their sign here so if the breakdown voltage is smaller than uh, um, uh, 4 eg over e then the breakdown mechanism is actually tunneling if instead the breakdown voltage is bigger than 6 eg over e for silicon this would be roughly uh, nearly 7 volts um, then the breakdown mechanism is actually uh, avalanche uh, multiplication so uh, for tunneling generally if the breakdown is happening at low voltages uh, uh, this means it is uh, through the mechanism that is based on is actually tunneling if the breakdown voltage is very large uh, above six seven few volts anyway uh, um, then uh, it means that is based on avalanche multiplication and this is because as we've seen to cause impact ionization you need a certain amount of energy and uh, um, for values in between the two phenomena are both probably playing a role okay oh in, in all this, we haven't mentioned thermal instabilities. Now, thermal instabilities uh, may affect more PN junctions where the breakdown mechanism is avalanche multiplication because in, in that uh, mechanism, a lot of energy is dissipated by heat into the crystal. While on the other hand, tunneling involves no or very little energy dissipation. There is no impact there taking place. Uh, so uh, uh, thermal instabilities can play a role in 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 uh, in, um, uh, in the in the uh, starting, let's say, of the avalanche multiplication process, for example. Um, now, as we said today, uh, we can. As we said today, and as we've shown also a few moments ago, the breakdown voltage of a junction can be en engineered to be a very precise value by designing properly the PN junction. And so those uh, PN junctions where the uh, breakdown voltage has been engineered to be very precise, uh, they are called Zener diodes. And the voltage, the breakdown voltage, is called Zener voltage. Uh, so uh, the the Zener uh, diodes in their uh, in the Zener regimes, the characteristic looks uh, uh, like this. So it's very a uh, fairly straight line. And uh, and as I briefly uh, anticipated today, this reminds us really a lot uh, the characteristic of an ideal. Uh, uh, voltage source as you can see here and this is the symbol of the of the Zener Zener diode remember and um, uh, as we will see probably in an application uh, next week uh, Zener diodes are actually used to stabilize voltages uh, to a specific value okay so but we will see probably this application next time and uh, uh, that's all I wanted to tell, tell you about uh, regarding uh, um, uh, uh, junction breakdown phenomena and uh, let me now uh, show you uh, the applications uh, I wanted to, to talk to you about today uh, on, on using uh, PN junctions so uh, the first one uh, uh, I wanted to, to discuss with you is the uh, uh, of the circuit applications is the voltage rectifier. So the, the diode, which uh, as we've seen in the, its simplest form uh, with, through the Shockley equation, is a device that 
in reverse bias lets through nearly no current, while in forward bias is very conductive, uh, is a, a, the ideal uh, device to perform what we call voltage rectification. So manipulating effectively uh, uh, a signal, uh, the shape of a signal, if you like. Now, the one I want to show you here with this circuit is called the half wave rectifier. So let us assume that I have uh, um, uh, uh, this circuit, <coughs> the series of a diode of a PN junction and the resistor, are, and these are connected in this way to uh, an, an AC generator, voltage generator. So I want to find out what's the shape of the output signal here, taken uh, in the way that I've, uh, I've indicated. So here is the solution. Okay, I will try to uh, uh, provide here two solutions. Uh, in, in, with increasing accuracy. So the first one is using what we call today the, the more uh, simple one, the, the more uh, crude one, the two-zone non-resistive uh, uh, piecewise linear uh, approximation. So I want to replace now my uh, PN junction. This is my uh, ideal PN junction according to the one that uh, operates uh, according to the shock equation uh, and I want to repl replace it with the two-zone non-resistive model that we saw today. So the two-zone non-resistive model, if you remember, was this one here, where we uh, approximate the operation of the pin junction with effectively you know, straight lines, horizontal and vertical. And so effectively, I will replace this with this. So let's do it. And so, as you can see, I've, do the, I've, I've, I've replaced my nonlinear component with now a linear equivalent circuit. Extremely simple, very crude approximation, yes, but will tell us something now. Um, <coughs> and so now I can analyze the circuit using the techniques we know for linear uh, uh, time invariant circuits. And so, uh, when when the input signal is, so the voltage that is presented at these two terminals, is smaller then VBI, look here we have VBI, uh, um, then the diode is off because obviously the potential here is larger than the potential here. And so the, pot the, the, the VDF that was measured this way is negative. So VDF is negative and so the diode is off. If the diode is off, the current through the diode must be zero. So the diode is an open circuit, if you remember, this, this is our ideal switch. And so this means if there is no current, the output, car, the, output the voltage measured across the resistor must be zero. If instead the input voltage is bigger than VBI, so the, this means that the potential here is bigger than the potential. Remember, the, the potential here is VBI. Um, this means that the diode is on, the F is on. If the diode is on, it can be replaced with a short circuit and the current must flow this way. And so if we replace it with a short circuit uh, and use it, we can apply easily KVL, uh, to the circuit, and so we easily realize that by applying ID, v, uh, uh, KVL, ID is equal to that, to, to, to this quantity. So ID is V in minus VBI divided by R. And so knowing that V output is R time ID, uh, we can easily see that the, the, the output voltage is actually uh, the difference between V in and VBI. And so, uh, just to conclude this analysis, uh, 
uh, if this is the input signal, what our uh, uh, analysis is telling us is that if the input voltage is smaller than VBI, sorry, if the input voltage is smaller than VBI, then the output must be zero, the output voltage. When the input is bigger than VBI, it must be the difference with VBI. And so what I'll do here, I'll plot on the input uh, uh, signal also the line representing VBI. And so in all those parts like this one, this one, and this one, where the input signal is below VBI, the output is zero. That's it. While there where the input is above VBI, uh, the output is the difference between V in and VBI. So effectively is this part of the plot. And th that I've copied here effectively. So, and you understand now why this is called a half wave rectifier. So, with a, we, with a very crude approximation, we already understand quite well how this circuit works. Okay, that's why I told you always start with the simplest approximation, which will give you a grasp of what uh, is, is happening. And, uh, and then you can complicate things more. So, then we can do the two zone approximation where now we use the resistors. As you can see, I've replaced here the, the PN junction, our ideal PN junction, with the two-zone approximation, but the simplified form. That was this one here, if you remember. So this was the full two-zone form, but we simplified it with this one. So when I will apply now, when you apply this uh, equivalent circuits, you can actually make use of these formulas just to simplify your, uh, your analysis. You know, there is no need to do everything from scratch again. And that's what I think probably I'll do either here, maybe. Yeah, probably. Let's have a look. So I've replaced uh, the PN junction with my equivalent circuit with a two zone uh, circuit. Uh, so the first thing I do is to write, uh, see, identify some uh, uh, important nodes. Uh, power node A, node B is actually these are two, the same node effectively because there is a there is a a, a, a a piece of conductor in between. So this is actually node B is actually uh, extended. Let's say is this one, and then node C down here. So I've identified these three points uh, that I will refer to. So if we apply KVL to the general circuit, this is a one mesh circuit, if you see. We have V in, we could write V in, is equal to VAB, this means VA minus VB, plus VB minus VC, okay, VBC. And so uh, VAB is actually uh, V in, minus VBC. I'm writing it here just because it, VAB is uh, uh, um, the voltage across my equivalent circuit. Okay, and this is what we use in the formulas of the equivalent circuit, is the voltage applied to the equivalent circuit. Is what in this, uh, if you see here, we call V. Okay, in that uh, uh, application, uh, uh, we call it, uh, we should call it VAB. Or oh, remember that VBC, by definition, is, uh, uh, is uh, VBC is RID, if ID is the current that is, according to here, is flowing in the circuit. Okay, so let's start the, the analysis. So let us assume uh, so we know from the the, the uh, theory of this equivalent circuit that we have two zones. So one where V is bigger than VBI, and so DF is on, and the current is given by this formula. And uh, when V is smaller than VBI, the diode is off, 
and so the current is given by this formula. Now we can use this straight away by replacing V with VBI. Straight. Sorry. By replacing V with VAB. And that's what I've done here. So when VAB is bigger than VBI, ID is VAB minus VBI over RF. Because DF is on here, ID must be positive. So I, I further emphasize that ID must be positive. So uh, what I'll do now here, I will, uh, I will exp further expand this uh, relation and also this relation in, in together as we go. So uh, VAB bigger than VBI means, according to what we said uh, up here, means V in minus VBC. V in minus RID bigger than VBI. And at the same time, I will replace VAB here with V in minus RID. So ID equal all these things. And uh, I, I make some order here. So V in bigger than VBI plus RID. And on the other hand here, I will uh, um, um, sort things a little bit, as you can see. Uh, IDs here, here and here, so I bring them all on the left hand side. And so in the end I can write ID equal to this, which is very nice. Remember that ID is positive. And uh, now, from this relation, how, how did I get this one? So from this one, I can conclude, from this relation, I can conclude that then this must mean V in bigger than VBI. And the way I do this is because if I look at the equivalent circuit when VAB is bigger than VBI and D is on, the forward uh, diode is on, so it can be replaced with a, series, uh, with a short circuit. And also we are neglecting now the reverse uh, resistor because we said today effectively that resistor is huge. It can be seen equivalent when the forward part is uh, active that uh, can be effectively neglected. And so that's what I've done here. So the equivalent circuit in this situation is this one. Now, in this circuit, ID has to be positive. And as we can see here, ID is positive only if V in is bigger than VBI. Only if V in is bigger than VBI. These are two, uh, imagine this could act as two counter uh, uh, power supplies. One is pushing the charge, this is pushing the charges this way, and this is if it was positive, was pushing the charges this way. Uh, for the total current to go this way, this has to win. So V in must be bigger than VBI for ID to be positive. And so this, that's how I went from this relation. I basically, uh, you know, I did this, uh, all the observations I made on this side allowed me effectively to drop this term. And so what really matters is that V in is bigger than VBI. And so if V in is bigger than VBI, ID must be this one. And so V output, which is R time ID, must be this one. We will comment on a mo in a moment on V, on v, or, uh, v output here, but I want to show you the journey we've done here, all to transform this initial relation that was specific to the uh, equivalent circuit of the PN junction, to transform that into something more relevant for my circuit that involves the input signal. Okay, because for this circuit, uh, VAB is not really relevant. What is relevant is V in. Okay, so uh, uh, this is something to take uh, into account uh, that you must learn how to do it, uh, to, 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 to transform conditions such as this one into something meaningful for this specific circuit. So V in bigger than VBI.
So when the in is bigger than VBI, anyway, uh, the output is this thing here. So as you can see, uh, the, the two zone approach is more accurate in the sense that now, as compared to the very crude one, uh, uh, the two zone non-resistive approach, uh, we have now a, a term in front of, of this term that we had found also previously. But there is now this term. Uh, R is the lower load resistor, if you like. But now is uh, the, the in front uh, the term in front of these voltages is R over RF plus R. Uh, this is, uh, reminds us a voltage divider. RF is obviously very small, so in general uh, it depends on the value of R, of course. But in general, this is a tiny correction anyway. And uh, for uh, for the other uh, uh, when the uh, for, for the reverse now situation, reverse bias situation regarding the PN junction. So I need to consider now VAB is smaller than VBI when DF is off. And so we need to consider the reverse uh, uh, resistor effectively. So when we are in this situation using uh, the, the above uh, approach, obviously I don't need to repeat the analysis again. We can already say that when VAB is smaller than VBI, then we can already say that this means V in smaller than VBI. So, uh, but in this condition, the piecewise linear approximation we are using tells us that ID must be VAB over RR. VAB is this. And so rearranging, I can find ID. And so I can find V out. And so uh, uh, here we found the output. You, obviously, you can see here the nice thing in the in the in the in the uh, with the two zone more accurate, let's say, uh, uh, model. Uh, you can see that when uh, the um, uh, the PN junction is reverse biased, previously with the crude model, we were getting that V output was effectively zero. Uh, but now we see that it isn't really zero. It is proportional to the input signal. Uh, but this number obviously is very, very small. Remember that RR is huge. Okay. So this number, but it's non zero. Okay. So <coughs> just to see these things uh, uh, in practice. Uh, we could uh, plot again our uh, test uh, input signal. Uh, this is our constant VBI for the PN junction. And so now, the uh, exaggerating now just to show everything, uh, the output uh, signal is uh, this is uh, the, the part that we saw also previously. Uh, simply now is uh, has this factor in front, as you can see. So the the actual maximum value is, uh, uh, is probably just a tiny bit smaller than just V in minus VBI. Or uh, note that uh, I didn't stress it previously, but with V in tilde T, I mean the entire time evolution of the signal, that this is a signal as a function of time. With V in tilde in without the T, I mean the uh, actual amplitude of this uh, sinusoidal signal, okay, so which is effectively this quantity is the amplitude. So this is, as you see, I've indicated here v in tilde. Uh, so while in the in the parts that are these where the actual p-n junction is in reverse bias, now we will get some signal. Obviously, I've, I've over. Uh, exaggerated it here, uh, but the maximum amplitude of this part is actually given by this quantity. Is the, the amplitude of the input time this quantity here, RR is huge, so obviously this quantity can be extremely small, uh, still very ap well approximated by a zero, but it, it, this is just to tell you it's not zero, that's all. Okay, so this uh, is uh, to show you how we can use 
first of all, an application of the PN junction as a half wave rectifier. And second, how we use the piecewise linear approximations to uh, then solve uh, uh, these, uh, sir these uh, 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 circuits, applications of the PN junctions uh, in practice. Uh, in, a, in a very simple way, using techniques that we know from linear uh, uh, circuit analysis. Uh, so, we've seen that no matter now which, uh, which uh, 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 technique we use, uh, we've seen that with the half-wave rectifier, we have a, a half-wave and then effectively something that is very small and then half-wave again. So, uh, the output output of, uh, of the half-wave rectifier is extremely uh, bumpy, let's put it this way. <laughs> so, uh, can we make this output voltage smoother? Well, the answer is yes, and the, uh, the, object, the idea is extremely simple. Uh, probably, if, if you have followed what, what we said uh, in one of our previous lectures, uh, I think the second one in chapter one, on chapter one, uh, the the easiest thing to do is just to put a capacitor. You see, this capacitor with this resistor, this is the load resistor, they make a CR circuit. So, uh, the capacitor can be charged, but will also di discharge through the resistor with a time constant RC. So, what do we expect that will happen? in our half-wave rectifier circuit. So, uh, if this was the input and this is uh, the output, the one, the output of the uh, half-wave rectifier we saw previously. If we add the, the capacitor, we should expect the red behavior. So, the, the, the capacitor will charge but then we'll retain the charge, we'll discharge through the resistor slowly, it depends on the time constant, okay? And then when the next bump arrives, it will charge again, and then maintain the charges, slowly discharge through the resistor and so on and so forth. Uh, we can demonstrate that this delta V, you know, the you see that this is, looks very much like, again, it is a bit bumpy, uh, and so the, this delta V here, due to the, discharge, to the discharge of the capacitor, is actually given by this for simple formula here, is the amplitude of the actual output uh, waveform, which is V in minus VBI, from our two-zone uh, non-resistive approach, very simple one, uh, time T over tau where T is the period, as I've indicated here, the period of the input signal, and tau is the time constant of the RC circuit. And so we, we clearly understand that we can make this delta V very small, maybe negligible, much smaller than the amplitude, by making tau much bigger than the period of the signal. Uh, we can demonstrate actually that delta V has this shape because we can remember that during the discharge the potential of the capacitor will fall exponentially according to this formula actually in this case. And so the delta V that I've indicated, which is the difference between the top value of the... Uh, oh, oh, I didn't stress that, but you can see that V output is V at the ends of the resistor, is also V at the ends of the capacitor. Okay, that's why I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm talking about the capacitor discharging and so on, the potential of the capacitor and so on, so on. They all uh, are, are, are the same thing. So, uh, basically, what I mean is that here I'm plotting V output, but effectively I'm also plotting the potential across the resistor and the potential across the capacitor. So, uh, the potential across the capacitor is uh, this one here, and so the delta V is the, 
the the maximum charge, maximum voltage across the capacitor, which is effectively the maximum amplitude of the output, which is V minus VBI, minus uh, the VC uh, after one period, T. So the value of VC, the voltage across the capacitor, at when T is equal uh, T capital, the period of the signal, roughly. And so this means that it should be something like this, if you do the calculation properly. But if we assume that we, ex we expand by Taylor this quantity, effectively we are assuming that T is much smaller than tau, we can replace this with the 1 minus the uh, uh, T over tau. And so we end up with this formula. And this is exactly what we had called here the ripple the amplitude of the ripple. Uh, okay, so um, so here we've, we've kind of seen a very nice application that we're using a halfway rectifier and using also uh, a capacitor with it, we can actually try and even stabilize the output voltage. So we were sending an input, a sinusoidal, an AC signal, and in output now we are kind of getting something that is a bit uh, uh, wavy, but is kind of uh, DC. And so uh, we are really realizing that what we are making is a rudimental AC-DC adapter. And the adapter is actually represented by the diode, the PN junction, sorry, and the capacitor, to which then we attach the load, the load the resistor, whatever that will be. So really, the combination PN junction capacitor is making the, the, the key uh, of our rudimental AC-DC adapter. So something that go, transforms from alternate current to direct current. So as you can see, I've stressed here, AC side, DC side. Okay, so if, uh, uh, remember the DC side here, what's the voltage applied to the load? The voltage is the amplitude of the input sinusoidal signal, the amplitude minus VBI, where VBI is the, of the, of the diode. So imagine now that you were powering um, uh, this uh, this circuit. We wanted to power it from the power line, you know, from the uh, uh, our uh, house uh, uh, energy. Let's say power from a power socket. Uh, so from our a power line with uh, uh, where the uh, RMS value of the voltage signal is uh, 240 volts and the frequency is 40, 50 hertz. So uh, we need, say, a specific uh, output, uh, DC output voltage. So what we can do in this situation, we can use an AC transformer to create an input signal to our a rudimental, as we called it, a rudimental AC-DC adapter, uh, an input signal that has an amplitude VO plus VI, VBI in such a way that VO is the desired VO, okay, that I mentioned here. Uh, in such a way that when V in is then transformed into the V output, uh, this must be decreased by VBI, and so you get effectively the V out you wanted, okay? And here we can see the, 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 the idea of this application. So I have a transformer that will transform a, a, a signal with a, a 240 volts RMS value to a, an AC signal with a desired in, uh, amplitude V in. And then we feed this to our rudimental AC DC adapter, and then we get our uh, nearly DC 
uh, signal, uh, uh, voltage in output that we apply to our load. So, for example, here I've, I've done a very simple example for you. So, let us create a, a, a very rudimental DC 5 volt supply with a ripple of less than 0 1 volts uh, to power a load R that is 100 ohm. Okay, and let us assume for simplicity that VBI is one volt. It's huge for our uh, type of pin junctions, but uh, just for simply to simplify the calculations. Uh, so let us assume that we want to power directly from our power sockets. So the VRMS is 240 volts, which means the actual amplitude of the AC signal is 340 volts. Remember, you need to multiply this by square root of two. And, uh, and uh, if we would then uh, want that V output is 5 volts, then V output, we remember according to our rudimental AC DC adapter, V output is also V in minus VBI. So V in must be 5 volts plus VBI. So V in must be the amplitude of the input signal to our rudimental adapter. The amplitude of that AC signal must be 6 volts. So this means we need a transformer that goes from an amplitude of 340 volts to 6 volts AC. And so, uh, if we remember the ideal uh, AC transformer, the ratio of the amplitudes between the primary and the secondary is equal to the ratio of the number of turns in the primary and the secondary. And so we need a transformer with this specific ratio. We can buy it, we can find it, we can even build it, whatever. We have it. And so, uh, further, furthermore, since F of the signal coming from the power socket is 50 Hz, this means that the period is 20 milliseconds, we set, we've set delta V to be 0, 1 volts. So, but remember delta V according to our formula above is V0, V output. Uh, time uh, uh, t over tau uh, where t re oh, remember that as you can see uh, as you can see delta v is indeed this is v output so it's v output time t over tau okay so going back to the example uh, we have that uh, all this must be smaller than 0, 1 volts. And so from this you can calculate tau, must be bigger or equal than all this, but tau is RC, and so this is a condition over C. So C must be bigger than this. And this quantity here, if you put all the numbers we've just come across, uh, V0 is 5 volt, the output, sorry, is 5 volt, this is 0, 1 volts, T is 20 milliseconds, R is 100 ohm. This gives you that C must be bigger or equal to 10 to the minus 2 farad. Now, I've put the uh, exclamation mark here because 10 to the minus 2 farad is quite a huge capacitor uh, and you will definitely struggle to, to find one. But just to point out that, you know, very simple, simple approach and you can make a relatively stabilized uh, power supply out of it. Okay, very nice application. One single diode, one capacitor, and you can make, and the one transformer, you can make a 5 volt um, DC supply out of your power line. Um, the last application I wanted to briefly mention is still on the um, wave rectification and this is now the full wave rectifier uh, so uh, this uh, circuit uh, borrows the ideas from the Whitstone bridge so as you can see the, these diodes these pn junctions are all arranged according to the uh, uh, P Whitstone bridge arrangement but uh, take care to the, their directions okay so as you can see uh, uh, the the, uh, the you know the, this is would let current flow in this way and this in this way 
Uh, this one lets current flow in this way, and this is in this in, only in this way. And then in between we have the resistor, and we are measuring effectively the potential uh, at, at the uh, uh, terminal of this resistor here. This is our load, if you like. Now, uh, what we get out of this circuit, this is a full wave rectifier, so all uh, positive and negative values of the input signal, AC signal, will be rectified properly. And so as you can see, if this was V input, the V output would be something like that. Uh, uh, I'm not going, you know, into the details of this, you know, I'm really doing a very, very rough now here uh, analysis, uh, but just to understand how this operates. And so um, the reason uh, the output looks like that is very simple. When V, let, let us imagine that V in is positive. So positive here, negative here. So current should flow this way and, and this way here. So when the current is flowing in this way, this means that once it reaches here, it actually has to flow on this side because this is a, is a, is a reverse biased. The current can't flow this way. Huh? So it will definitely flow here. Once it reaches this point, the current, the current can't flow this way because it would be on the opposite, on the wrong side, let's say, of the uh, diode. And so it has to flow along the resistor. And once it reaches here, remember the current is going from positive bias to negative bias. So once it reaches here, it won't move back again there because it would be moving toward positive bias, while the current has to move toward the negative bias. So at this point, it will move uh, uh, toward, along this, this diode here, and so then here. So the current is effectively, when, when the V in is positive in the way that I've indicated here, the current goes this way. So the important thing is that through the resistor is flowing in this direction. When we go and look at what happens when we think of the opposite situation, when V in is now negative here and positive here, so if here is negative and here positive, the, po the current here must be going that way and here that way. So this means that now the current must flow in this direction, using similar argument as above. But what we notice when we do this is that through the resistor, the current is again flowing in this direction. So, no matter the polarity of the input uh, voltage, through the resistor, the current is always flowing in the same direction, and so V output is always positive. And so that's why we are capable, effectively, of seeing the signal as always positive. And so, uh, similarly to what we did said previously, again, we can make the output of this circuit smoother by adding a capacitor a parallel to the resistor here, for example. Okay, and so you, again, this is a good circuit that someone, even better than the previous one, that you could use to make, uh, 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 to attempt to make, for example, a, a stabilized uh, DC uh, a very r simple yet, but uh, stay r relatively stable uh, DC uh, voltage uh, uh, supply to supply your uh, load resistor. So that's all I wanted to show you as applications of nice applications of our PN junctions, and we will see more next uh, next week. So uh, thanks for thank you for listening and.